were here last year. I had a broken TV. I came in crushes. I preached sitting down. And now look at me. I'm going up the steps, carrying my iPad, carrying this, carrying water. So if John invites me next year, I'm going to come in like doing backflips. You know, that's the goal for next year. <laughs> It's always good um, to be here. It's always a joy. Uh, so I'm grateful uh, to the leadership here for the opportunity that they give me to be here. For those that are new, um, maybe this is the first time or you haven't been here since last summer and you don't know who I am. So yes, I'm the pastor at Lighthouse Church. I am from Honduras. That's why I have the accent, and um, I live on the west side. It's really a joy to, to um, be here. Uh, I married someone from Wisconsin, um, <laughs> and that's why I'm here. But it's, it's truly a joy to be able to serve in the Dane County, in the community. Let's pray. Father God, we give you thanks for this morning. Thank you for the opportunity that we have to, to be here, to learn more about you, to just receive the word. Father, I pray that you will use your word, which is uh, mighty and powerful. Use it to transform our hearts, to renew our minds. I pray, Father, that your word will come out with power and authority and that it will accomplish the purpose for which you sent it, God. I declare that it will not return void. Thank you for everyone that is here. I pray that you will bless them and I pray that they will be able to receive the message that you have prepared for them. Use me as your vessel, use me as your instrument and that everything that I say, everything that I do will be for your glory. Father God, we also give you thanks for this nation. Father, we pray protection for this nation. We pray, let your will be done, Father, uh, during these difficult times. In your name we pray, amen. And I want everybody to say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So um, I have a message for you that is all about the heart of God. I want you guys to understand what the heart of God is. This is a study that actually I did um, some time back, and it really touches my heart. Because the heart of God is a heart of love, a heart of mercy. Um, and I want us to go to Luke 15, verses 1 to 2. Luke 15, verses 1 to 2. And this is what it says. Now all the tax collectors and the sinners were coming near him to listen to him. Both the Pharisees and the scribes began to grumble, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So what's happening here? So here's Jesus talking to sinners. Tax collectors at this time, they were people with a bad reputation. They were corrupt. They were working for the enemy. And they were seen as the enemy. They were seen as uh, sinners. They were seen as people that did not follow God. And, 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 and God is talking to them. Jesus is talking to them. Jesus is loving on them. Jesus is serving them. And here come the Pharisees and the scribes. These are the people of the law. These, these are the people that are within the church. This is the church. These are the people that the scholars, those who used to teach the word of God, the Old Testament, I mean, these are like the ones that have the minister of divinity, the doctor of ministry, uh, all this stuff. And they're, they're upset. And why are they upset? Because Jesus is talking to sinners. Because Jesus is loving on sinners. So after all of this happens, he tells them in, in, in this end chapter, chapter 15, he tells them three parables. First, the parable of the lost sheep. This is about a sheep lost. And that's where, you know, he will leave the 99 to find that one that is lost and loves on the sheep, puts them in his shoulders. Then there's the story of the lost coin, where someone loses a coin and finds them and there's great rejoicing. All of this talking about those who are lost, those who are outside the body of Christ. And then there's the story of the prodigal son. And that's what I want to focus on. But all three of these parables are a response To how, and I will say it like this, to how the church, how believers feel, oftentimes about when we deal with those outside our bubble. You know, when you have been part of the church for a long time, we become part of the bubble. You know, and a lot of what we do is with the church, and we hang out with the church, and, and we go to the pool with the church, and, and we do a lot of the things, and that's all good. But so oftentimes we feel like we're like a special category, and then we get upset when we see a sinner. And why are they doing that? And why do they live in such a way? And why do they behave like that? And why do they uh, believe in those things? And God wants to show us his heart towards those who don't believe what we believe. Towards those who are not living the life that we think people should be living. Towards those who maybe are not honoring God in the way that we um, think that we're honoring God. 
So God is a love, a God of mercy. God receives you just as you are. Isn't, how many of you are happy that God receives you just as you are? God is a God of second opportunities. I'm, I'm grateful that God gives me a second and a third and a fourth opportunity. God celebrates it when one who is lost, the sinner, is found. So I want to use this story, the story of the prodigal son, and I kind of want to uh, give you more insight about the story so that you can get what the heart of God is. And the hope is that God will also speak to you, whether you are the one that feels like you are the prodigal son or the one that you feel like maybe you are like the Pharisee, upset that we're receiving prodigal sons. You know what's happening in Harlan? All these sinners are coming. So let's start with Luke 15, verse 11. And he said, a man had two sons. Jesus said, a man had two sons. Here's the thing. Many of us have read the story of the prodigal son, have read the story of the prodigal son. And what happens here is we often think that it's the story of one son. But really, this is the story of two sons. It's the story of two. One who lives, one who's lost. But it's also the story of one son that is within the house and still lost. This is the story of two sons and they're both lost. This is the story of two sons who are not really walking in what God wants them to do. And as we go through this story, maybe you feel like you are the prodigal son that left home. Or maybe God convicts you and you feel like maybe you're the prodigal son that you are within the house. But you're not too happy about those that are coming to their senses. So speak to us, Lord. So there's two sons. And Jesus is telling them, both are lost. But both are loved by the Father. So let's start with the younger son. It says, Luke 15, let's read verses 12 to 13. And he says, the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the state that falls to me. So he divided his wealth between them. And not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together and went on a journey into a distant country. I want everybody to say a distant country. And there he squandered his state with loose living. So this is something that I want you to understand. Uh, United States uh, and, and, and countries like uh, many countries in Europe, um, this is a culture, uh, it's called an individu individualistic culture. Most countries around the world are actually part of a, a culture that is called a collectivist culture, where everything is about us, everything is about the community. I'm not saying one is better than the other, I'm just saying they are different. But in this culture, everything is about me and what I can do, and what's going to happen to me. Most countries around the world, and when this was written, when Jesus is talking to these people, Jesus understands that those who are under listening to this story understand what a collectivist culture is. It's not about me, but it's about us. It's about the community. It's about uh, what's happening to the community as a whole. Uh, so, so you need to understand that, because when Jesus is saying this, this is uh, the culture that is listening to what Jesus is saying. At the same time, This culture in the Middle East, still today, but back in, back in the day of, of Jesus when he's telling the story, is a culture of honor and shame. Everything that is happening is about honor. You know what's honorable not only for me, but for the whole community. And also about putting people into shame. Actually, the Bible talks about that. And oftentimes when we read those verses about, you know, shame on this person, or this person should be put to shame, we go like, whoa, you know, because we're living in the United States. In this culture, this is a normal thing. You know, so, so I want to give you that insight so that you can understand what's truly happening here. Because what's happening here is a son is pretty much saying to his father, I wish you were dead so that I can get my inheritance. That's very, very, very dishonorable. I mean, this son is not only dishonoring his father, he's dishonoring the community as a whole. But also what the father is doing is actually very shameful. To actually, uh, he, the father probably had, we, we think that he probably went to the bank, took a big chunk of money, gave it to the son, and the son left. No, most likely what this father had to do is that he went and actually sold some land. He actually probably had to sell some of his properties, some of his land, so that then he can give some of this money, some of this wealth to the son. Very shameful for a father to do something like that. The community, because again, it's a collectivist community, would have said, what is wrong with this father? 
Why is this father spoiling this child in such a way? And why is this son so dishonoring to the father? So I want you to understand what's happening here. This father represents God. And you're probably wondering, God? But God doesn't do anything shameful. But here's the thing. God has given us free will. He's not going to stop us from doing what we want us to do, even though some of the things that we're doing bring shame to him. But he has given us free will, and he says, that's not my will for you. That is not what I desire, but it's up to you. So I want you to think about that. And then I wanted you to think, to, to, to say that phrase, a distant land, because what does this represent? This distant land represents a place of darkness. And I want you to think, as you are sitting here, distant land represents a place of darkness, represents the world. This means that he was outside. He went outside of the protection of God. The protection of his father in, in this story. The protection, the backing, and the support of his father. So what is God saying to us? What is Jesus trying to explain to the community while he's telling this story? Because some of us, and I'm not talking about you have to go too far away, you know, uh, in distance-wise. But oftentimes we can be here and we go to a distant land. We go to a dark place. Maybe a relationship we shouldn't be in. Maybe we go to a place where, where, where we want to live like the world. We want to act like the world. And we go to this dark place outside of God's realm, outside of God's protection, outside of God's blessing. And this is what's happening here. Then let's read verses 14 to 19. It says, Now, when, we had, when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred, in that country, and he began to be impoverished. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he will have gladly filled his stomach with the pots that the swine were eating, and no one was giving anything to him. But when he came to his senses, everybody said he came to his senses. He said, how many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread? But I am dying here with hunger. I will get up and go to my father. And I will say to him. And listen to what he wants to say to him. Father, I have sinned against you. I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. And I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. So here's what happened. This son, he goes to a distant land. In other words, he went to a dark place. He went and lived like the world. Maybe he got out of the church. Maybe he decided, you know what? I don't want to do this God thing anymore. Stop reading the word. And now he's living his own life. And the Bible says that he came to his senses. And that's a good thing. God help us. There's some of us that we need to come to our senses. But here's what happens. When you go to a distant land, when you go to this dark place, when you start living like the world, there's something that happens to us, and that's that oftentimes we get an orphan spirit. What does that mean? That you feel like you're not worthy to come back to God. And if you come back to God, maybe you can come at a lesser level. I miss my opportunity. And he says, when I come to my father, and think about this, he's calling him father. When I come back to church, when I decide that I want to go back to the things of God, when I want to set my life straight, I know I'm going to have to pay for it. I'm going to stay here at the edge. Even though this is what God wants for me, I missed it. So I'm going to stay here. So I'm going to be just a servant. And we start thinking about an orphan spirit. But think about a distant land. What does the distant land mean to you? What does it mean to go to that place of darkness? Because the distant land, the world, outside of God's protection, is a place of lack. There was a famine. You can be succeeding financially and doing all these things, but if you are not within the will of God, there's going to be a famine. It's a place of lack. It's a place of misery. It's a place of shame. Remember, this is a culture of honor and shame. And when Jesus is telling this story, he knows what he's saying. And the people understand. Because when he talks about 
This guy has lost it all. That's very shameful. But not only is shameful, and then he tells them, and now he's working feeding the pigs. That was the most dishonorable thing you can do if you were a Jew back in those days. Why? Because pigs were not clean animals. God actually says, stay away from them. Don't eat them. Don't eat eat uh, pigs. Don't be close to the pigs. Don't do anything with pigs. So Jesus knows why he's saying that. He's doing the worst of the worst. This is the most shameful thing that he can be doing. And God is saying, in the midst of that shame, in the midst of that pit where he is, in the midst of that, dark, that darkness, in the midst of that horrible thing that he's doing, he came to his senses. Oh God, I pray that as we hear these words, we can come to our senses. And he comes to his senses. But again, feeling like he missed an opportunity. Now let's think about this father though. Because this is where the good news come. And the Bible says, starting verse 20. So he got up and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him. And ran and embrace him, and kiss him. And the son said to the father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. And it's almost like the father is not even listening. Because immediately the father says, But the father said to the slave, Quickly, bring out the best robe, and put it on him, and put a ring on his hands, and sandals on his feet, and bring the fattened calf, kill it, and let us celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been, has been found. And they began to celebrate. Here's the beautiful thing. It doesn't matter what you have done. It doesn't matter how horrible the sin you have uh, committed. It doesn't matter how much darkness you have been involved with. It doesn't matter what you were doing. God, this father represents God. God is waiting for you. He's waiting for you, filled with compassion. He's waiting for you, filled with compassion. The Bible says that he ran. Again, we're talking about a culture of honor and dishonor. I mean, honor and shame. And when Jesus says that the father ran, there was a reason. You know, it was a dishonorable thing back in those days in this culture for a man to run. So Jesus knew what he was doing. And that was because they wore those robes. And when a man ran, uh, you could show your legs. And that was a dishonorable thing. So for a man of this caliber, who obviously, I mean, he had uh, uh, servants. Uh, he had wealth. He was an honorable man. And all of this is about honoring and, and, and having a culture of honor. And I'm the honorable so-and-so. So he ran, meaning that he was willing to put himself in shame. That was a shameful thing to go and receive his son. That's the love of this father. I, I have a 16-year-old, and um, yesterday she said, oh, father, you know, we're going to go and have a, 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 um, a, like a fire, like with, with some friends, it's like 100 degrees yesterday, and like, you know, she wants to go and do a fire. And I know whenever she asks me to go out with her friends, that can I have a sleepover is going to come at any moment. You know, and immediately she's like, can I go with my friends? We're going to have a fire, you know, and, and, and we're going to hang out. And, 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 and I said, you cannot stay overnight. I mean, I, <laughs> he was like, okay, kind of saying, okay, but you cannot stay overnight. That's all I said. Because we have church tomorrow and, um, you know, she, they're part of the worship team. You know, my family, my, my wife and children. And I'm like, we have church tomorrow and, and you cannot stay overnight. Like around 9 p.m., I get a text. And the text says, Dad, is it okay if I stay overnight? I didn't even answer it because I had already told her, you're not staying overnight. And then my wife comes to me. You know how children are. They'll ask you, and then you're not answering. They'll go to, you know, Mom. And, and my wife says, um, did you see uh, Isabella? Is her name. Do you see Isabella's text? And I said, yeah. Are you going to reply to her? And I said, no. I already told her, <laughs> you know, that there was no sleepover. You know, and she's like, you know, Papi, please, and like there's a hurricane here in Oregon, wherever she is, and like there's a storm, and a tsunami is about to hit us, we cannot leave the house, 
And like, she's telling me all these things, right? So I was like, fine, but there's going to be consequences. You know, I, I, that's what I said. Fine, but there's going to be consequences because I have told you not to. And then I said to her, like, if, how are you going to do a sleepover if you don't have anything, you know, for the sleepover? He's like, well, I do. You know, and I'm like, well, why did you bring stuff for a sleepover if, if, if I said no? You know, and then we're having this conversation. And then this morning, before I came here, I get a text from her. And I said, I love you, papi. Why is she sending that? Because she's coming home. <laughs> And she knows I'm not too happy. She knows there's going to be consequences. You know, so usually our children come home like walking on eggshells. They don't know what to do. Should I come in through the front door, through the back door? You know, I'm going to be watching soccer in a few hours. Should I say hi to him? Should I wait until the game is over? You know, and like, like my dad is probably going to be thinking like that. And this is this son. It's like, oh my goodness, what should I do? And like, you know, here's my father. But that's not Jesus. And the truth is, I'm not going to probably be outside waiting for her and run to her, you know, when I see her. <laughs> I probably should, God, you know, maybe he's speaking to me. I should and love her and be like, I love you. You know, but most likely I'm not going to be doing that. I'm probably going to give her this eye and give her this look. And she's going to walk to him like, you know, like a tail between her legs. But, 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 you know, but this is not God. He ran to him. And this is what he does. He goes to when the son is saying, you know what? I did wrong. I wasted all your money. I put you to shame. What I did was dishonorable. And the father says, go and get the best robe. He speaks to the slave and he says, go inside the house and get the best robe. Have you thought about this? Who do you think has the best robe in that house? The father. The best robe in that house is the one that the father wore. And what the father is saying, here comes my son who put me to shame who did a dishonorable thing, and I'm going to give him my best robe. The father didn't have a robe that was just saved for like a special location. No, it was his robe. Because you know what the Bible says? That Jesus will take our dirty rags and clothe us with his cloak of righteousness. He's doing an exchange. But not only that, as I think about this father running, one of the things that they did in these cultures, because again, culture of honor and shame, and I'm going to be saying this, is that when you did something that was shameful, because these cultures are collectivist, they do everything as a community. If your child does something that is dishonorable, the whole community is going to get involved and put the kid to shame. And what they used to do in this community, and these people who are hearing this parable, they know about this. What this, they do in this community is that they bring you to the center of the town, they get a clay pot and they break it in front of you and in front of the community as if to say, you are a broken vessel and you are good for nothing. That's how they will put people to shame with the hope that they will turn around, repent and come back. But that's what they will do. They will bring you to the center of town and in front of everyone, they will break a clay pot and say, that's what you are. A broken vessel, good for nothing. And as I was thinking about this and as understanding this, I'm thinking, could it be that the father ran to the son because he wanted to get to the son before the community got to the son? He wanted to get to the son before he was put to shame. And then when he brings him home, he says, quickly, go and get him the best robe. Why quickly? Before the community gets involved, before you are put to shame. And then he says, and bring him a ring. This is what you need to understand about the ring. You did business. Someone like this man, in a culture of honor, they will do business with a ring that is honorable. And he will stamp things with that ring. And you know what the, the father was saying? You don't have to stay with the servants. You can come into the house and do business with me. You can go back to your old position. Jesus says, I have to do the business of the Father. Oftentimes, when we go to this dark place, when we go to the world, when we fall into sin, we feel like if we come back to God, He's not going to use us again. Oh, we missed the opportunity. And God is saying, I want to give you my best role, and I want you to do business with me. And then what does He say? He says, and bring Him sandals. You know why? 
Because during this time, and everybody, you have to understand that these people that are listening to this are understanding this because this is their culture. Servants, slaves did not wear sandals at that time. And here's this son saying, let me be your servant. And the father is saying, bring him some sandals because he is not a servant. Bring him some sandals because he is going to be dressed as my son. And that's what God is saying in this culture of honor and shame. Jesus put himself in shame for you because he loves you. Not so that you have a lesser place, but so that you can fully enter into his love, into his house, into his relationship, and you can live the life that he has created for you. But then what happens? Let's read verses uh, 25 to 29. Now his older son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. There was a celebration. And he saw one of the servants and began inquiring that this, uh, what this could be. And he said to him, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he became angry and was not willing to go into his father, to go in. And his father came out and began pleading with him. But he answered and said to his father, look, for so many years I have been serving you and I have never neglected. The people are understanding, hmm, they sound like Pharisees and scribes. I have never, uh, I, I have been serving you and have never neglected a command of yours. And yet you have never given me a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. There's more that we can learn from these verses. First, this fattened calf was enough to feed many people in the community. So what is that telling us? That this father who was dishonored, this son who was put to shame, was willing to bring the community, again, it's a collective community, and say, I am not ashamed of my son. And look at the robe that he's wearing. And yes, I'm going to give him sandals because he's not going to be servant. And look at his ring. From now on, community, if you want to do business with me, you can do business with my son. He was inviting. This was a celebration where the community was invited. This is the heart of the God that we serve. That when the world wants to put us into shame, he wants to love us and transform our lives. But then what happens? And remember, he's talking to the scribes. He's talking to the Pharisees. And he says to the scribes and to the Pharisees, let me tell you about this older brother who has done everything that he's supposed to do, and he stayed in the house, and he's following the commandments, and he's doing everything. And yet, there's something wrong in his heart. He does not want to receive the Father. Oftentimes, we are here in the church, and we go to the services, we go to the Bible studies, we volunteer, we bring the lasagna that you're supposed to bring, and you do the everything. But yet, you're doing it, because you're trying to gain points. And then you say, I was there at church. I go to both services. And I brought lasagna. And I serve a children's church. And I do this. And I do that. And I do this. And why does that person who just arrived is getting all the love? And why are they serving in this ministry? And I am not. And it's all about me and me and me. And God says, there's something wrong in both of you. And this is the beautiful thing. For those who are in the dark place and come to the senses and come back, the Father will run to you and embrace you and love you. For those of you who are here but have the heart of this Pharisee, he's willing to come out and look for you and tell you, come back in. Come into the will of the Father. Do what's right. We have a picture of a father who loves sinners and loves the Pharisee and loves everyone. And what he wants is for everyone to do the will of God. And as we are here today, the question is, which one are you? What is God saying to you? Are you in a distant place? Are you in a dark place? 
Are you in a place of darkness at night? Or maybe when no one is looking at you? And you know that you're not doing the right thing? And you know it's a shameful thing? And you're probably thinking, how do I get back? Look at the mess. Jesus couldn't give us a picture of a horrible situation, a bigger picture of a horrible situation. This son was at the worst place ever. He couldn't dig any deeper uh, deep for himself. He was in the worst of the worst, the most shameful place. And still God said, I'm here for you to love you. Not as a servant, but as a son, as a daughter. I still want to do business with you. Your calling is still there for you. The blessing is still there for them. The heavens are still open for you. You can still be the light. You can still be the salt. You can still be the person that I'm going to use to change some prairie, some prairie for Christ, the county for Christ, the nation for Christ. You're still that person. Even though right now you might be feeling like I'm not worth it. But maybe you are also here. And maybe you're feeling like, Why is everybody getting an opportunity and not me? I'm serving and I'm serving and I'm doing and I'm doing. And no one is looking at me. And God says to you, I am looking at you and I love you. And wherever you are, God is willing to run to you. And he's willing to come out to bring you into his place, into his will, into a place of love. We have a father who's waiting for you. We have a father who is so full of love that he'll put himself to shame. That's what Jesus did. He's willing to die as the worst of the criminals so that you can come to him. Some of you are lost. Some of you are in the world. Some of you are in the church, but doing your own will. And today God is speaking and he's saying, come to me wherever you are. Receive my heart. Understand my heart for you. If you're lost in a distant land, he says, come to me. If you're here, but you're doing your own thing, he says, come to me. If you're angry, he says, come to me. If you're hurting, he says, come to me. If you reject sinners, he says, come to me. If you feel like you have an orphan spirit, he says, come to me. If you're in a distant land because someone hurt you, maybe even in the church, he says, come to me. And I will love you. And I will bring you inside my house. And I will clothe you with my best clothing. And I will do business with you. And I will treat you like my son and like my daughter not like my servant. This is the heart of a God in of love who's here for you and is here for them and is here for the whole world. And I want you to stand on your feet. Father God, I want to give you thanks. Thank you for this word. Thank you for the picture that you have given us of a God of love, of a God of mercy, of a God of second opportunities. And Father God, and I give you thanks for every person that is in this place right now. Father, thank you for their lives. Thank you for the way that you love them. Thank you for the sacrifice of your son, Jesus, who was willing to leave his divinity behind and put himself to shame and die on a cross as a criminal for my sins. Father, I think about that song that says that I had a debt that I couldn't pay. And he paid a debt that was not his. And he did it for me. So for those of you who are sitting here, and maybe you feel like you are in a distant land. Maybe you're in a place of darkness. Maybe you're lost. Maybe you feel like you're in the midst of sin, and you don't know how to come back to the Father. The Bible says that he's knocking. Revelation 3.20. He's knocking at the door of your heart. And he's saying, open your door. Ask me to come in, and I will give you a new life. And life abundant. The old will pass away. And behold, everything is going to be made new. So Father God, I pray 
That those who are here and they're feeling like they're in a distant land, that they will come to their senses and understand that we can come back to this father of love that is willing to embrace us. And Father, for those who are here at the church, and maybe we have a heart of bitterness, maybe we're angry like the older brother because we see the sinners being blessed. I pray that you will convict our hearts and help us to have the heart of the Father. Thank you, Father God, that you ran to us. And thank you, God, that today you're coming outside to bring us back in. Father, I bless this congregation, and I pray in the mighty, mighty name of Jesus that they will be the congregation that has the heart of a father so that many, many will come to you through their testimony, through their light, and through their serving. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.